Good to see you all this afternoon. Let's turn to Psalm 72. Psalm 72, we are continuing our ongoing Sunday afternoon series entitled God's Hymnal. And this is message number 43 in our series. Psalm 72, I'm looking forward to this psalm and I'm sure you will as well as we dive in. It's a psalm for Solomon. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. He shall judge thy people with righteousness, and thy poor with judgment. The mountains shall bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He shall judge the poor of the people. He shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers that water the earth. In his days shall the righteous flourish, an abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. He shall have dominion also from sea to sea, and from the river unto the ends of the earth. They that dwell in the wilderness shall bow before him, and his enemies shall lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of the isles shall bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. Yea, all kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. For he shall deliver the needy when he crieth, the poor also, and him that hath no helper. He shall spare the poor and needy, and shall save the souls of the needy. He shall receive, redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. And he shall live, and to him shall be given the gold of Sheba. Prayer also shall be made for him continually, and daily shall he be praised. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. And blessed be his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into this beautiful psalm, I pray that you would open our eyes the eyes of our understanding, that we may be able to not just understand what you're saying, but also, Lord, that we would know how to apply it to our lives. Lord Jesus, this is a beautiful psalm, and I pray that you would help me to explain it, help me to be simple and not complicated. Holy Spirit, we give this service to you now. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. King Henry VIII, probably one of the most known kings of English history because of his many wives. Uh, his wives could not give him a son, and so he divorced some of his wives, and actually he executed some of his wives. He had one son, Edward VI. Edward VI was a brilliant young man, a teenager. Henry VIII died suddenly, and he left the king, the kingdom, to his son. However, he was only nine years old when he became king, and Henry VIII established a, a, um, a group of men who would help Edward rule until he became 18, where he would rule on his own. But at nine years old, 
He had a heart for God. One author nicknamed him the British Josiah, named after the young king of Judah in 2 Chronicles. On Coronation Day, Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, gave him a charge in front of all of the nobles of the, um, of the land, the kingdom. And here's a little excerpt from it. Quote, Cranmer said, Not from the Bishop of Rome, but as a messenger from my Savior Jesus Christ, I shall most humbly admonish your royal majesty what things your highness is to perform. England was not under the powers of the Roman Catholic Church. It was uh, Anglican. It, became its, it had its own church under Henry VIII. He continues, Your Majesty is God's Vice Regent and Christ's Vicar with your own dominions, and to see with your predecessor Josiah, God truly worshipped and idolatry destroyed. You, King, are to reward virtue, to revenge sin, to justify the innocent, to relieve the poor, to procure peace, to repress violence, and to execute judge justice throughout your realms. For precedence, precedence on those kings who perform not these things, the old law shows how the Lord revenged his quarrel. And on those kings who fulfilled these things, he poured forth his blessings in abundance. For example, it is written of Josiah in the book of the kings thus, quote, Like unto him there was no king that turned to the Lord with all his heart, according to all the law, the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. End quote. That's what Cranmer said to Edward VI a nine-year-old king. But this is what he concluded. He said, The Almighty God of His mercy let the light of His countenance shine upon your majesty, grant you a prosperous and happy reign, defend you and save you, and let your subjects say, Amen, God save the king. Edward VI was a king for six years. He tragically died at the age of 15 by tuberculosis. However, his coronation was a beautiful coronation, very um, spiritually thought through, especially because of Edward's keen heart for the Lord. I believe he was a true believer. But here we have in Psalm 72, we have another coronation of King Solomon. You find in the uh, headline of the psalm a prayer for Solomon. Now there's been some debate as to whether Solomon actually wrote this. I disagree with that because of the end of the psalm it says the prayers of David the son of Jesse are ended. I believe David wrote this prayer. He prayed this for his son. You see, David was at the end of his life. He ruled Israel for 40 years. He needed a successor. You read in the first chapters of 1 Kings, one of his other sons, Adonijah, tried to take the throne. But David promised Bathsheba that her son, Solomon, would be the next king. And so he ordered Bathsheba, he ordered Nathan the prophet to... Uh, start a procession, organize a procession for Solomon, that everybody knew that Solomon was the one that David chose. So this is a prayer that David wrote for Solomon. However, there are parts of this psalm that show that this is a prophecy of a future king. A future king. I entitled this message, The Coronation Psalm, and I want you to know I want you to learn from this that we have a king coming. And as his subjects now, we are to give him the most 
honor, and glory that he deserves. Now we find in this psalm five characteristics of this future king. Five. Now, some of these characteristics Solomon had, but I will tell you, Solomon was only a shadow of what this future king would be. And I believe this king is our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will one day establish his earthly kingdom. What is this first characteristic of this king? He would have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. Look at verse 1. The, the actual request that David makes. Everything else is prophecy. Give the king thy judgments, O God, and thy righteousness unto the king's son. Hmm. So there's two requests here in this one prayer. That he would, number one, have God's judgments. God's judgments. Now what are God's judgments? They are his testimonies. They are his laws. His precepts. In short, his word. The very psalm that came to my mind as I was studying this was Psalm 119. The very psalm that talks about the word of God. In that psalm, the psalmist calls the word of God his judgments 18 times. Here's some verses for you. Psalm 119, verse 30. I have chosen the way of truth. Thy judgments have I laid before me. Verse 43. And take not the word of truth utterly out of my mouth, for I have hoped in thy judgments. Psalm 119, verse 156. Great are thy tender mercies, O Lord. Quicken me according to thy judgments. Bring me to spiritual life by the very word of God, by the inspired word of God. Now, this is important because in the days of Moses, before he was to leave the scene and Joshua was to lead them into the promised land, the children of Israel I'm talking about, he gave Israel commandment concerning when they would have a king. It was God's will that they have a king in the future, but he gave them very specific qualifications for their king. Now, one of the things that their future king would do when they became a kingdom was that he would personally copy the law word for word. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20, Moses said, and it shall be when he, that's their king, sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn, get this, to fear the Lord his God. To keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. And that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. To the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom. He and his children in the midst of Israel. So David I'm sure knew what Moses said in Deuteronomy. Solomon needed to do the same thing, too. He needed to write a copy of the Word of God. It is something special. Something happens when we write down the Word of God. It does something into our hearts. Wouldn't that be a, a project? A good spiritual project that every Christian took? That we would actually write our own copy of God's Word? Like, writing a copy of the book of John, or James, or 1 Peter, or any, any epistle of the New Testament, or any Old Testament book. The Word of God becomes a part of us. That's what the king was supposed to do. When he did that, it became a part of him, and he would rule by it. Now, this is the second request. 
that he would have God's righteousness. So the fear of the Lord, the, the future king would have the fear of the Lord through knowing God's judgments and that he would have God's righteousness. And David prayed that Solomon would not just have the word of God in here, but he would also have it in here. Not only would he know how to conduct himself, but he would practice it. Do you know that you can know God's word and not allow it to affect your life at all? One preacher said, I heard him say, that there's 18 inches between heaven and hell. You see, you can know the Bible verses about salvation, about receiving Jesus Christ, but it means nothing until you actually take a step of dependence on it. You trust Jesus to save you. You can know it in here, but it does nothing until it gets to here. But I also believe in the Christian life it's the same way. You can know so much scripture, and I think American Christians, we in America know so much scripture. We go to Bible conferences, we have Bible colleges up the wazoo, but we do not apply the theology, the Bible that we know to our lives. If we did apply it to our lives, i very sure everyone would see it, the lost would understand and come to Christ. We would be the salt and light that we should be. Now, when their king, when Solomon had his judgments and his righteousness, it would do something to him. Verse 4, he would be an advocate for the poor and needy. It says, he shall judge the poor of the people, he shall save the children of the needy, and shall break in pieces the oppressor. Solomon, the prayer for David was, by David, was that Solomon, as he knew God's judgments and that he would apply them, that he would be an advocate for the poor and needy. Solomon was this way in 1 Kings chapter 3, the whole story of how there were two harlots who had children, and one of them the children of one of them died. And one harlot said to the other harlot that they, she stole her child. This came to King Solomon. He, in his, all his wisdom that God gave him, he said, let's split the child in half. There was one of them, one of the ladies, said, no, King, don't do this. Give her, give her the child. The other lady said, King, your will be done, do whatever you want. And Solomon, with his wisdom, knew that the lady who vindicated, who wanted the child to live, was the mother. He was an advocate for the poor mother. But a future king is coming who would be an advocate for the poor and needy the Lord Jesus. And we find so much in the Gospels that he performed miracles while he was on earth. He healed the sick. He rose people from the dead. He made the lame walk. John the Baptist was doubting whether Jesus was truly the Messiah. Are you, are you, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus gave him back the answer. Look at what you have seen. The blind can see, the lame walk, the deaf hear, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Jesus was telling John the Baptist that this is prophecy in Isaiah 35, that the Messiah would do this. And that encouraged John the Baptist. He will condemn the wicked. The future king will condemn the wicked. And Solomon was to do the same we find in chapter 2 of 1 Kings that he would kill Shimei, who cursed his father, David. Now, let me ask you this question. A future king will do that. This future king, Jesus, will do it too. And let me ask you this question. If he condemned the wickedness of the Pharisees, don't you think he'll condemn the wicked 
at his coronation day, when he has his own kingdom, oh, you better believe it. You better believe it. Read Psalm 2, where all the kings of the earth will one day set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed. And they'll say, let us cast our bands asunder and break our cords from us. And then we find that the Lord will have them in derision. The Lord Jesus will have his day. And on his kingdom, you see, God's judgments and God's righteousness would affect the king. It would, in this prayer, David wanted it to affect Solomon, but it would also affect his people that he ruled. Verse 5, they shall fear thee as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. Now, this is not saying that um, the people will fear Solomon. This is a prayer to God. So this is saying, God, if you do this for the king, for my son, the, his dominion, his people will fear you. When Solomon built the temple, a beautiful, beautiful edifice, the glory of the Lord, the Shekinah glory of God filled the temple. And the congregation fell on their faces because... Jehovah God came in and they said, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. Second Chronicles 7 verse 3. But when Jesus Christ comes, all will know who he is. When he sets up his millennial kingdom, they will know who he is. Jeremiah 31 34 says, they shall no more teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and, their, and I will remember their sin no more. People will be refreshed and relieved by his leadership. Verse 6, He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass, as showers of water the earth. And look at verse 7. In his days shall the righteous flourish and abundance of peace so long as the moon endureth. Under Solomon, there was no war. It was a time of peace for Israel. All the wars, all of the conquest was done under his father David. David conquered more land, he conquered the Philistines, the Jebusites, and some other uh, sections of Canaan land. But under Solomon was peace. This was the prayer that David wanted for Solomon. But we find here that Jesus will one day rule, and under him will be peace. Listen to Isaiah 2, verse 4. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. There's all this cry for peace between nations. Let's get along. Let's work together. But my friend, for millennia for millennia there have been peace treaties upon peace treaties upon peace treaties and there's always been war peace treaties have been broken but when Jesus comes he is and will be the prince of peace because righteousness is how he will rule People want peace, but they don't want righteousness. You can't have peace without righteousness. You find in the scriptures, peace and righteousness come together. When people are living right, they will live in peace. Now, a second characteristic of the fear of the Lord, of the future king, global reign. Very quickly, God gave a promised land to Abraham in Genesis 15 
a land that would be for his descendants. He even told Abraham to look north, south, east, and west. He said, Abraham, all this land will I give you. He told him that his descendants would one day have land from the border of Egypt all the way up to the Euphrates River. I'll have it this way because Euphrates River is up here, if you look at a map. That's a big chunk of land. Now, under Joshua, when he led the children of Israel into Canaan, they were supposed to conquer even far up north into Syria, the land of the Hittites, according to Joshua 1.4. Under Solomon, when Solomon came to the scene, we find in 1 Corinthians uh, Kings 4.21, he would have that from the border of Egypt to the Euphrates. However, not all of that land was actually his dominion because some of these surrounding nations like Phoenicia under Hiram, king of Tyre, for example, they pay tribute to Solomon or taxes to him. One, because they knew of his wisdom, they knew of, their father, of his father David, out of respect, and because of trade deals that Solomon made with these nations, they paid tribute to him. So they were not officially his. Now, Jesus will one day have a future kingdom. I believe that God will keep his promise to Israel that Abraham's descendants will have that strip of land where even places that Joshua couldn't conquer. You read Ezekiel 47. It gives greater details of the border of the coming millennial kingdom. And from this vast area of land that Jesus will reign, he will rule, he's going to rule the world. Psalm 2, verses 6 and 7. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Ask of me, this is God the Father saying this to God the Son. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Psalm 2, verse 8. From this piece of land, this kingdom that Jesus will rule, he will rule the world. Number three. International respect. International respect. Every nation on earth has the right, the sovereign right, to establish its uh, rapport with other nations. To put their nation in the world stage. Every nation has the right to do that, as long as it's peaceful. It is allowed to look for its own interests. Solomon had international respect because he was wise and he was wealthy. 1 Kings 4.34 says, And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. Here's some examples. Hiram, the king of Tyre, which would be Phoenicia, north of Israel. He had his people cut down cedar trees for the temple, according to 1 Kings 5. Chapter 3, verse 1, he makes a league with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And from that came a marriage to Pharaoh's daughter. And you read later that Solomon even built a house for Pharaoh's daughter. An expensive venture. The Queen of Sheba. She's given a devoted an entire chapter is devoted to her. Sheba is modern day Yemen, which would be in the Arabian Peninsula. She came to Jerusalem to test Solomon of his wisdom. 
says that she asked him hard questions. And chapter 10, verses 6 through 7, it says that his wisdom and wealth far exceeded what she was told. She was told one thing, but when she came to Jerusalem, it far exceeded what she was thinking. You find later that she gives gifts to Solomon. It says here in the psalm, verse 10, The kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring him presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba shall offer gifts. One of those gifts was gold. And you do the math. She gave him about four and a half tons of gold. She was astounded, flabbergasted, if you will, by just the, the wealth, the wisdom, and when she saw him go up into the temple, it says that she had no more spirit in her. She was awed by the worship of Jehovah God. And here you find in verse 10 that the kings of Tarshish and the isles shall bring presents. Where's Tarshish? Many scholars believe it is in southern Spain. So if you looked at the map, you have Europe on the top and Africa on the bottom. Israel would be on the eastern coast. Spain is all at the other end of the Mediterranean Sea. Under Solomon, through the Phoenicians, Hiram's uh, ship industry, would be trade. And you read the scriptures, you find that Solomon even traded with people in Tarshish. He also traded with people in the Arabian Peninsula. That's where all the wealth and the income was coming in to Israel. And Seba, that's Upper Egypt, also traded with him. So Solomon had international respect with other nations, from other nations. But Jesus Christ, he will have even greater respect. We find in Psalm 2, verse 9, that he will one day break his enemies with a rod of iron and break them in pieces. The prophecy of Daniel in chapter 2, verse 44 of Nebuchadnezzar's image. In the image, in the dream, the image will be broken in pieces by a stone that was made without hands. And this stone, Daniel even describes it, is representing a kingdom that God will establish, which the Lord will set up, and it will break in pieces the former kingdoms. The idea of breaking them in pieces. He will humiliate his enemies. And you find a prophecy fulfilled in Revelation 19.15 that he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. A rod of iron. All nations will bow down before him. Psalm 2, again I refer, because that's a messianic psalm. The psalmist said, Kiss the sun, lest ye be angry and ye perish from the way. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. And Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This future king will have far greater respect than Solomon ever did. Prosperity of the people, number 4. Really quickly, verse 16. There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. The earth itself, in his kingdom, the soil will be able to grow corn in the mountains. Now, here in the United States, where is corn grown? In the Midwest, in flatlands. But it says here in verse 16 that there will come a time when there will be corn that will be able to grow in the mountains. That's how prosperous 
the millennial kingdom will be. People will be flourishing like the grass of the earth. There is nothing more beautiful, in my opinion, when it comes to outdoors like a healthy lawn of grass. I love seeing just grass, a, a, a lawn, which is something we, we don't see here in New York. We don't see lawns very much because of all the concrete that we live in. That's why it's called the concrete jungle. But you may look out in Long Island, for example, you see houses with lawns. Or in New Jersey, you see some houses with lawns. Some of them, some of these lawns are beautiful. The owners take really good care. If you've ever used a lawnmower or a trimmer, you go around the, the uh, lawn with this, uh, with the trimmer. It spins so that it cuts the edges of the grass. But I've seen some lawns that are dry, arid. Looks like no one watered them or no one has taken care of them. That would be the opposite. The opposite of people flourishing would be people withering like dry grass, where the people are suffering because the leaders on top don't rule with God's judgments and they don't rule with God's righteousness either. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. But Jesus, he will be righteous when he's king. He will know God's judgments, and under him, his people will flourish. And lastly, he will be given honor. His name shall endure forever, verse 17. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Solomon was given honor during his 40 years of reign, of Israel. However, you read chapters, uh, chapter 11 of 1 Kings, his heart for God began to wane. And he even departed from God because of his 700 wives. Many of them worshipped other gods, um, false deities, and they turned his heart away from God. And all of the Blessing, spiritual blessing that Solomon received were gone. And then his son Rehoboam was not wise either. And because of his reign, the kingdom split. And it would be split for the remaining uh, time until the Assyrians and Babylonians took over. But the Lord Jesus, he will have honor. His name shall be continued as long as the sun. As long as the sun is shining, Jesus will have honor, and all nations will call him blessed. What is the application for us with this psalm? Number one, you and I need to give him honor. He is worthy. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Why? He is the Lamb that was slain. My friend, if you have never bowed the knee to Jesus Christ, if you have never trusted Him as your Savior, why not today? My friend, He is the only way to eternal life. He's the only way to, to have a intimate relationship with God, you need to put your trust in Jesus. Because there will come a day when you will have to put your, bring your knee before him, bow the knee before him, instead of you wanting to. Christian, our Savior deserves honor as well. He is worthy. Where in your life are you not allowing him to be king? Is there a place when it comes to your media choices, your TV, your music? 
How about your words? How about your clothing? Perhaps there's an article of clothing that you realize, oh, come on, this is not a big deal. But what if Jesus came to you and he told you, that needs to go? Will you let him be king in that area? Or are you going to be king? See, we don't have to wait until Jesus, the second coming, for him to be king. Let us make him king now in our lives. Let's pray. Father, we pray right now that if there's any area in our lives where you are not king, that you would work in our hearts and show us I pray, dear Lord, that we would surrender and yield completely. Lord Jesus, if there's anyone here that has never made you king through salvation, through uh, dependence on your son for their sins to be forgiven, I pray that they will do so even today. Lord, open their eyes and may they see their need that there's only one person who can forgive them of their sin. Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Thank you for your uh, teaching us through this psalm. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified this week. Use us. May there be people that we come in contact with that uh, need you. And may we share with you, with them, what you've done for us. In Jesus' precious name.